So I talked about this with some folks at RollerCon and it turned out we had a lot of questions um, that came up during that. And so I wanted to make sure that we shortened things up um, and that we have more time for questions. But if you do notice this is recording, so if you're uncomfortable with saying questions out loud with recording, like Meg was saying, the Q&A is a great place for questions. And Meg will just be like, Catherine, stop and answer this question. Or you can certainly like chat amongst yourselves in the chat. Obviously very informal. This is roller derby. I'm just trying to help people to get whatever information they need at whatever level they're at. So I am Catherine. I am the events and facilities manager for the Rose City Rollers. I've been here about five years. Actually, I think it's more like six, but like with COVID, I don't even remember how many years COVID went on. Um, so I manage a unique set of issues pertaining to local permit and landlord constraints at the hangar of Oaks Amusement Park, right? I came on board and there was a terrible relationship with the landlord and the fire marshal's office was always mad at us. And the OLCC was like, what are we even doing over there? Um, so there was a lot of, oh, Meg is saying, going to presentation mode, please. Hmm. Oh, with the, with the actual thing, yeah, okay. I can do that. Present. Oh, thanks. Meg is telling me what to do. Oh, thanks. Sweet. Got a little flustered with all that can't get into Zoom situation. Um, this will be much more beautiful. So yeah, and the OLCC was like, what are we even doing? And our vendors weren't always pleased with the communication. So th there was a lot to cover um, when I first got into the Rose City Rollers, but I do have a background of permitting temporary and permanent spaces across the country for art installations. So. Um, my biggest skill set is when people tell me no, I say why not and how high and what can we do to make that no a yes. And so I'll hopefully give you some of those skills in this, but they weren't certainly things that like came to me. You know, when I first started permitting spaces and someone would say, no, you can't turn that vacant bank into an art gallery in Washington, D.C. for that client for two weeks, I'd be like, okay, I can't do that. But uh, what I learned over the years is you can find the right person to ask the right questions that you can get what is stopping you and just knock those things off your list and you can get a yes because people want your money right people want your business and people want to support roller derby once you explain really who you are and where you're coming from they're going to want you in their space so let's just like go into things with some confidence and hopefully some information in this presentation will give you some confidence or also just having my phone number and the other phone numbers of the folks at Rose City Rollers who are always happy to make sure that you guys have somebody to bounce questions or issues off of. We're here for you. Uh, the hangar itself, if you've never been there, it's 12,000 square feet, no running water. <laughs> People love that. Uh, capacity capped to 100 or less for practices with a handshake deal with the local fire marshal's office. The actual capacity for our space should be more like 50. Special events permits run on an annual cycle. We've negotiated to use these permits flexibly to run our 50 games a year. So we use this special event permit when we do our games. In this presentation, we're gonna talk more about just finding a practice space. I'm gonna do another presentation that tells you a little bit more about the ins and outs of where you might go to find the ability to make your space into a space where you can host like fans and bleacher seating and, and bar and all of those things. Um, but for us, we have this weirdo situation going where the fire marshal knows we're here, they know what we're doing, they know this building isn't flammable, but currently a code was put in place with a fire marshal, three fire marshals back where the limit for a space like ours should be 50 people. Um, in the front of our venue right there, you can see that big black piece of fabric is there because when we open those front doors, they're 50 feet wide, right? So it's like, we all know that there's clearly no risk of people not being able to evacuate this building, right? But does it fit the exact parameters of the code in the city of Portland? It does not. Uh, we toggle from a full bar license to a nonprofit permit by annually as fits our needs. Um, that's something I've learned to do. So I'm happy to help you if anybody gets to that point too, because you can make some good money with alcohol sales, especially if it's donated. Rose City Roller, roller Schedule is highly dependent on working with the amusement park to keep traffic on our little tiny road in and out of the park manageable for our parties. So over communicating with our landlord has been really key to keeping things humming along here. Um, 
and documenting, documenting, documenting what they told us in various conversations and who said it. So that when we come back and say, you know, they say, you're not allowed to have any games in October, which is what they told me last month. And I was like, no, I have an email saying that we're having these games in October and we already have sponsors, partners, incoming teams, all those things set. So let's sit down again and see like what's making you say this no, because we need to get back to where you already told me yes. Uh, check boxes for Derby spaces specifically, right? You guys know this stuff, but um, what I wanna make sure that you understand is that some of this is a little bit malleable, right? We've got the WFTDA approved minimum track with the 10 foot rest lane, uh, guidelines for track and audience space. It's all laid out in the risk management guidelines, right? You're looking at that guidelines. You're like, I need to find a space that fits this exact guideline because otherwise my insurance does not cover this event, right? That feels really scary. Um, check your surface across the entire floor plan. But so here's what I wanna note about those WFTDA guidelines. They're not set in stone. Um, the guidelines are pertinent to the insurance coverage. So the people that underwrite the insurance are gonna maybe look at your space, your practice space, or eventually your game space. And they're gonna say, yeah, there's a column in turn two, but they're planning on you know, putting a bunch of foam around that column. I've seen that done at roller derby venues, you probably have as well. Um, they're planning on making sure that they have a specific measurement from, you can see with us where that star is, the hanger does not meet the minimum clearance for that guideline, that, that like static map, uh, but we have a specific variance from them, right? And they're very nice people. They wanna help you succeed. They wanna help you have a roller derby. So if you have a practice space and you're starting to run full scrimmages and you're starting to get worried, okay, am I not in compliance with these guidelines? If someone gets hurt, how am I gonna be liable for that? It's best to just have a direct conversation with them about the issues that you're facing because it, it could be that they'll say, okay, you know, for, for the hangar specifically, right, we're allowed to have, I can't even read those numbers anymore because I need new glasses, but we, we, we measure to the track line and that is our variance, it's called a variance to the, to the standard. Um, and so we're able to run games with that variance and scrimmages and everything else that we do. But you do wanna make sure, you know, for the most part that you are in compliance or you are asking those questions because otherwise you're, you're not insured right? Because if there is a claim filed, they're going to say, where were these folks practicing? Well, they were practicing in the garage of a bowling alley and there were columns everywhere. And is that okay for a practice scenario with them? Probably. Is it okay for a scrimmage scenario? Maybe. Is it okay for a game scenario? Probably not. But asking those questions and again, getting those answers in writing is going to help to make sure that you do when and if, you know, God forbid the time came and someone did file a claim against you, that you're in compliance with the standards of what the track sizes should be in order to keep like spectators and your, especially your skaters safe. If you need to lay sport court tiles, you'll need to factor in that expense. When I got to Rose City, our sport court was in pretty bad shape. So I got all excited about finding a bunch of different tiles on eBay and different places that I could mix and match. And I learned a lot about what not to do. So if you find yourself in that situation, absolutely. Um, hit me up. The folks at the courttilediscounters.com site were really, really nice to me and helped me find some really good stuff. Um, talk to other leagues, put the word out on social. You know, we found that a couple of leagues were like people that were no longer skating, had a storage unit that they'd been paying on for years. And they happened to have a half pallet of sport court in that storage unit. Um, you want to find them. You can find them on eBay for sure. You can find huge lots of sport court on eBay, but don't trust it unless you sent someone in person. Someone in your league knows someone in Philly that can go to the storage unit and take a picture of this stuff and take some close-up pictures and make sure you're not buying a bunch of warped sport court because this stuff does not like to be in a super hot or super cold environment. We're fairly lucky in Portland that even without climate control, our sport court has lasted this long, but it's not gonna last um, according to the manufacturers like suggest, I believe they say it lasts 30 years, right? Well we're wearing through this sport court in 10 years for sure. And a lot of it was bought used, as I said, but it should have better longevity, but without climate control, it does not. So if you're finding sport court somewhere, just make sure that somebody's vetting it to make sure that it doesn't have a bunch of warping or they can mail you three tiles, right? Cause that's super cheap. Just grab a FedEx envelope and get those to you in the mail. The other thing that's fascinating about sport court is that <laughs> tiles of different vintages, uh, will connect 
or will not connect. So suddenly I had like all this sport court and I was like, yes, we have enough sport court to make a new floor. Everyone's going to be so thrilled. And then instead I'm sitting there with my group of volunteers realizing, okay, there's a, there's a, there's a less than a centimeter between some of these different sizes of sport court. So what we ended up doing was doing a bunch of math, not me, somebody better at that in the league did the math and then laying them out in the tiles of which ones were which sizes and then making this crazy ass look that we skate on at road city rollers right but we, we made it work but i want to pass that on to you guys that if you are in a position of needing sport court there are some tricky things the manufacturer told me before i bought any of this sport court along with the new stuff i bought from them that like absolutely there had been no changes in the mold over the years you know it's always been the same mold the, the, the family that owns it has always had control of that mold that's not true I mean some something was changed somewhere over the years I don't know when because these aren't like stamped with different dates on them right the individual tiles but they did not in fact just hook together so um just make sure that you're you know checking and asking a lot of questions or getting your entire lot from one place if you're cobbling it together get those different tiles mailed to you and make sure that you don't have those issues with overhang because those just pile up as you lay 10 tiles, suddenly you have this much overhang and it stops, stops uh, functioning at all. So this is what Chloe and I always say, Chloe's Nana is like 98 years old or something at this point. This is Chloe, my assistant who runs Skatemobile. Um, and when, I, when we met and I started talking to Chloe about my way of approaching, trying to get shit done, um, she's like, oh, it's like Nana says, don't ask, don't get, right? You ask people for things and then they can say yes or no, but you have to just keep asking. You have to keep asking. You can't be afraid to ask for what you need. Um, so once you define your needs, you should look at what you need, you know, next week, right? What hours can you deal with? You have a league of, you have 10 people, but maybe in one year you want to have 50 people. That's a very achievable goal for a small roller derby. So what hours are you gonna need? So you're gonna need three practice times by the end of the, you know, by the end of next year, not one. You're gonna, um, how much more budget will that bring in if folks are paying dues on that time? Uh, you know, can you run more than one function in the space? Can you run meetings and things in the space? Is that gonna fit what you need in a year from now as well? And then the parking accessibility, obviously like a warehouse, Situation could work great for 10 people, but then when you're trying to park 50 cars, you're running into issues. So look for what you need now and a year from now, just make yourself a little sheet and know that you're guiding yourself so that you're not in a situation where you're once again, looking for a practice space within two or three months, because you don't want to keep having that scramble. That's what burns all of us out at roller derby, right? Where we're just like, let's get this thing done. Let's get it done. And then we get this other thing done and they get to, and then we have to redo the first thing. So try to think ahead at least a year to what you might need. Um, so strategically thinking about what, how you wanna get the information out, right? Like such and such a league needs practice space two or three times a week, a month, whatever it is you need. Put that really clearly, that list out on all their social media, have your league members do that as well, whatever is comfortable for you. But if you wanna eventually be talking to landlords and folks like that, um, you're going to want to eventually be on LinkedIn. Weirdly, it still exists. And if you haven't checked it recently, you should maybe take another look at it. Think about putting some posts on there because those are folks that do like to solve problems. And if they see a nonprofit struggling, there could be people to connect with on there or that a league member already knows on there that may be like, oh, my office building since COVID, people haven't come back to the space. There's an entire parking structure that's you know, maybe it's even climate controlled, who knows? Maybe it has running water, maybe it's better than the hangar. I don't know, but somebody could know somebody. So make sure that that bulleted list is very clear to all your league members, what it is that you're all looking for, you're all on the same page. You're not following rabbit trails in that way, right? Where you're like, Laura saw a space on the corner of this and this, but she just looked in the windows and, it, and it's like, let's stop that. Let's try to find the decision maker or somebody who knows about these spaces and go in person with your list and everybody has that list so that you know she knows that she's not just texting the point person which is probably one of you since you guys are the badasses that are trying to make shit happen for your league right you don't want that person just texting you you want them to be able to refer back to the list what steps do they take to get you the information you want you know maybe you have a, a google spreadsheet where it's like laura saw a space here and here here's the number for the real estate company that was listed on it 
or she was able to go in and talk to an office person and get this person's number or whatever so that so that that league member knows how they can be most helpful um, to you as you're looking for a space so you can break your your needs down however you want to break them down but they don't have to be super complicated um, you want to encourage your members to spread the word and reach out to people in their networks right so that seems really obvious, but what we found with doing this with a lot of league members and then also people that just want to help, right? Partners, teenagers who are badasses who are like, I want, you know, I want to skate roller derby, I want this to work. Uh, like grandparents of those teenagers, all the folks that want to share it, you want to create a place they can find that information. The bulleted list that I'm talking about where you're defining your needs now and defining your needs in a year for like kind of what your dream is in a year from now, that shouldn't be in an email PDF. You want that to be somewhere. It could be in a Facebook group, it's fine, but somewhere people can be out and about, they can find it on their phones, they're at a business function, you know, they're at a networking thing. They meet someone who's interested and fascinated by the idea of this roller derby taking off in, in your city and they can find the list. They're not going through an email and trying to open a PDF, which may not even work on some people's phones. You need it somewhere like live on the internet in the cloud so that people can find it. For us, we use Wild Apricot because it does a lot of things for us. If you ever want to talk membership software, Wild Apricot's awesome and very, very scalable, very, very affordable for leagues. But it gives us a place where we can have a forum where we post about things. This is the official venue post. Plenty of other people are posting about venues all the time, but our league members know when they want to find the actual information that we're looking for, um, that we are looking at the official venue post. And then also all of our membership tracking is in there, all of our insurance, our COVID records, all of that's in Wild Apricot. So really cool software, kind of digressing there on what's possible with that. How are we doing, Meg? Do we have questions? I think people are still digesting this. I think another thing that I would point out for a lot of leagues that are smaller than ours and depending on the location you're in, there's a lot of really creative ways to find a venue, even if it means just a practice space. And Catherine will dig into some of this in terms of how do you actually find the people to contact if you see a venue, if you see something that's like a warehouse or another uh, type of space that you think would be useful to your league. She'll get into you know how to actually talk to people once you identify a space, but also, um, getting creative. I was skating for a league in Maine in a very small town and we found a recreational center that had a hockey rink that they didn't use in the summertime. So we were, we were able to use that space as our practice and event space on a temporary basis. Um, but yeah, Catherine can dive into once you find a place that you're interested in, how do you go about starting this conversation? Absolutely. Like Rose City Rollers started, I mean, well before my time, but in the basement of a bowling alley, uh, right? It was, Meg, was it like an actual parking lot part of the basement or was it just a basement basement? At the beginning of Rose City Rollers, I think if they were actually practicing under an overpass <laughs> for a while. So. <laughs> that doesn't perfect. sound insurable. So let's not do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we've come, we've come some distance since that, but yeah, um, you know, public schools, have huge gyms you know community centers have gyms those are some great places to start depending on how friendly those folks are in your area and it really does come down to that like how willing to play ball the various people are going to be who you want to track down right so how to find a building owner of a property loopnet is the place for like big commercial properties you start looking at loopnet when you have a league of a couple hundred and you're going to start having games in a dedicated space and you're going to sign a, a real honest to god lease you know that's going on and on I wouldn't look at LoopNet if you're just looking at a practice space for like 10 to 30 people, you're going to get overwhelmed. Like, Jesus Christ, these costs. Unfortunately, Craigslist is dead. It's all scammers in Portland. Maybe it's not in your area. Maybe it, because it, I mean, six years ago, Craigslist was still great here, but at this point, it's just overrun. Um, Facebook Marketplace could be a place where there's some stuff. But again, to start your professional level search, you're going to want to be on LinkedIn at some point to talk to property development companies or folks who may have a share space that you can use and to have that presence. In Portland, we have portlandmaps.com. You have something in your local city that tells you who owns the building, right? So if you find Oaks Park, I look on there, it tells me who owns it. I can find them and I can give them a call and say, hey, Oaks Park, I noticed that you had a huge 
warehouse on your property that seems to be being used for storage. I'm imagining that's somewhat of how the conversation went with Rose City way back when, right? Like um, this, this warehouse looks like it's being used for this. I'm excited to bring a new concept to, to you guys. And this is how you're gonna start talking to them is like, um, so super sleuthing who finds the property, who, who is finding the information about who's in charge of it. Um, sharing and subletting, like who are your partners in sport, right? I mean, basketball uses a large, large space. Hockey, obviously hockey is a great place um, to start, especially if you're in the Midwest or the Northeast. Um, in Florida, you may be able to use like the Los Anarchists skate year round outdoors, right? In LA. Uh, so other places you may be able to find an outdoor space that fits your parameters. Um, show up in person, ask questions, get some stickers printed. People will remember you if you give them a free sticker. It's just the way that people's brains work. Um, you know, figure out if maybe you can use the space intermittently. Um, you know, if they're like, oh no, you know, you could never use the Mount Scott Community Center basement, which is a real thing that Skatemobile uses. Um, our schedule is just too packed. And say, oh, what's your schedule? Oh, okay, well, I actually see that Sunday afternoons from three to five are in fact available. And that's would be a great time for our league members. So knowing that your schedule is really packed, how can I make this as easy as possible for us to book that space for the next 12 months? You know, just keep asking questions just because one person at the front desk is feeling a little overloaded that day. They might not give you all the information that you need, but you've got to just kind of keep digging to find things. Um, be really confident. You're representing an inclusive, well-established sport. You have a superpower. You have a sick amount of insurance to bring to the table. This is not some shit that people have that are trying to start a youth soccer league in like you have this insurance policy from WFTDA that you have is power in your hands because you are able to say, I have $10 um, million of aggregate insurance. People don't have that, right? So you wanna lead with what you have. You're in a well-established sport representing an inclusive base of people, super youth centered, um, lots of great examples of awesome youth programming can be found all over the internet in terms of roller derby. That's very compelling stories to share, even if they're not your stories, they're still roller derby stories and you're going to start creating those stories yourself, but you leverage this insurance. I was talking to a league member, um, from somewhere in the Midwest, not too long ago. And she was mentioning that they were trying to find a practice space along with like, a, a just like a community jam skating group that wants to find a space. And they were thinking, well, that's a partner in sport, a really obvious partner in sports. We're both looking for a skating surface. How can we work together? And I encouraged her that you're actually, the roller derby organization is the leader in that conversation because you're bringing this insurance to the table that is built into you being a WFTDA member. So you're gonna be able to go to any space and be like, not only can I pay you some money for a space at a time when you're not using it otherwise, I can provide the insurance policy that's going to make you feel really confident and comfortable that you're not gonna get dinged for an insurance claim on this space. Cause that's the main reason someone's not gonna to wanna to rent to you for a couple hundred bucks, you know, bi-weekly or whatever it is that you end up negotiating. They're gonna be like, yeah, I'm not gonna take on that liability. But with roller derby, they're actually not taking on that liability because you have this hefty insurance policy. How to make a formal approach. So be professional, even if you ended up meeting the person at a networking event and you both had four vodkas and you had a great time together, I would still follow up with an email that's like, but I actually mean business. I'm a person that means business and wants to get this shit done. So um, this is a sample of how I might approach it, right? Be professional. I'm the founder, board member, venue hunt representative. You're not just Susie. You're, you're in charge. You're in charge of this shit now, right? This is you. You're the badass. It's on this like webinar because you're gonna make this shit happen for your league. So title yourself as such. Um, be very clear about how many members they have. Um, we're looking for a dedicated space or maybe you're looking for a share space and then go right into the insurance that you have. Um, and all of our skaters are also insured. Don't have to worry about that. Uh, we follow all of Roller Derby's international safety guidelines to run a safe and inclusive sport for our membership. Our mission is make a big deal of yourself. If they've never heard of roller derby, then you want to also, in your first couple of sentences, just note that it's an international sport with international guidelines and safety parameters and officiating. Like, 
let them know that you're a big deal and that you're part of a big deal and that you're going to bring really cool stuff to their to their space and some people may care about the first part right they might care that your mission or um they might they would care about the last part sorry that what your mission is right somebody might care about the middle part what's my liability here and someone else might just be like intrigued by roller derby i think i've heard of that right i saw whip it whatever um but i would just make sure that you're bulleting those those things as your tops in in an approach because you want people to take you seriously from the get-go even if you did drink four vodkas with them the night before and then be really honest you know don't say in five years i'm going to be able to pay you ten thousand dollars a month rose city still doesn't pay that much we don't pay ten thousand dollars a month we're hoping to find a bigger venue and it will cost way more than that but and um, we're also at the point of being able to get grant funding and things and sponsorships at a level where we feel like we can afford that. But we've been really, really conservative with staying back at Oaks Park. Um, not that there are a ton of other options in Portland right now because commercial real estate's through the roof. But um, being conservative about where you're going is good because you don't want your partner to burn out on you after the first year. Well, they said we'd start to, you know, get this much from membership revenue and we'd be able to bump the rent. You don't know what's happening, you know, global pandemics and fires, floods, all those things aside, um, be sincere about where you're going as a league. If the decision maker doesn't support where you plan to be in a year, you're signing a one-year lease, that's not gonna work, right? So again, to have that list of what you're gonna need in a year so that you're really clear about, I'm gonna have 50 members coming in. That means 50 people are gonna be parking on the streets around your building. Are your neighbors gonna be mad, right? Cause you don't wanna then in eight months when 50 people are parking, you're like, but. I said I was going to go to 50 people. It's like, well, let's talk about the actual issues that might create, right? Like you might have a sound ordinance situation and they don't like whistles after 8 p.m. and you get one kind of pissed off neighbor. So it's good to just make sure that the landlord knows where you're going because the landlord's going to be able to back you up if any neighborhood stuff comes into play with where, you, where you're skating. Um, as I was mentioning, I'll also get things in writing, recap face-to-face -face discussions over email and record your Zoom calls. Just be like, yeah, I'm going to record this because I'm in a super hurry and I don't have time to transcribe these. I'm doing this on my lunch break or whatever. Just record it and hopefully everyone will be cool with that. But that's another way to just get a quick, um, you know, an assertive like recap for the future that like this was said. We were both there in the room or on a Zoom call and this thing was said. And so how are we then moving forward? Like people are pretty stretched then these days if they weren't always. Um, so just, you know, kindly refer back to what was said before, not your perception of what was said. Hopefully you wrote down what was, you know, actually said verbatim, or you have a recording from a Zoom call. Um, sell yourself as a mission-driven nonprofit, queer inclusive sport, well-established kids programs across the country. If someone's just shutting you down, someone doesn't want to talk to you that day, um, use the opportunity to find out more. I can tell you're in a hurry. When can I call you back? When is a good time to call you back? Or um, what other businesses or properties do you own and who's the decision maker for those businesses and properties? You know, if it's, a, if it's a group of community centers, each one's managed individually, right? Like I know that we have a gym in Portland. It's um, East Side something something gym. I used to be a member there when I lived on that side of town. I didn't even know they had three other locations in town because I'm just like, they're going to my gym, but they're all independently managed. Turns out one of them would, if another roller derby starts in Portland, the West side one would be great for a roller derby to skate during um, off hours in their like workout room. It's gigantic. So it's a retrofitted space. So just, you know, wh where else do you guys own space? Who else could I talk to within the organization? Try to keep asking questions and get to the person that's going to really listen to you. Um, and then, so building capacity that can come into play. I touched on it before, but can be kind of scary sounding like some buildings are only allowed to have gatherings of like 15 to 20 people because they don't have any running water. They don't have, um, fire extinguishers. They don't have safety exit signs. They don't have those push doors, you know, that in an emergency, when handles are hot, you can push the bar, especially with people on skates. I'm sure the fire marshal would love it if you had a place with a with a push door. But when you get to the point where you're skating more than 50 people in a room, you will have to look at what does your building capacity support, unless you're in like a really freewheeling state that most states I've ever worked in, and even including like Florida and Texas, where I've done pop-up art gallery stuff, 
have had fire marshal certified capacities on the door in the paperwork for this space. And that's something that's important to adhere to because you can get into some trouble. Um, but you can find out what's dictating the building's capacity limits and work with them to fish the issue. Excuse me, fix the issue. Like I was saying, you know, if you put in those push door things or if you put up a lighted exit sign, they're going to be like 20 more people. And if you're like, we're putting in a PA system where we can announce that there's an emergency, they're going to be like 10 more people for that. Um, I've even done a thing in a couple of different cities where I had someone who was a fire standby person just stood there and looked around to make sure there wasn't a fire starting. And then the fire marshal's office would be like, you get 50 more people for having that. So it's important to have somebody involved in the process. If it's not you, somebody that you trust, that's good at reading that paperwork because you'll be able to find these places like, oh, I can solve this. I can solve this. I can solve this. And before you know it, you're getting yourself up to a capacity that's what's needed for your practice space. Um, you know, if you end up having like larger scrimmages and want to have some viewers in the room and things like that. But likely if you have a big open space, you know, open span space where you're trying to skate 15 people, this stuff won't come into play. But again, it's about thinking about that one year from now plan. Like in one year from now, if your goal is to have 50 or more people in this room, maybe you need to start saving now so that it's not the night before you first do that when you realize, shit, we need to go buy $500 in fire extinguishers to make this room okay for that to happen. And it's as simple as that a lot of the time, you know, just having the fire extinguishers on hand, um, you know, having the sprinkler system on hand would make you have the ability to have a gazillion people, but most of the spaces you guys are gonna be looking at and our space doesn't have that because we don't have running water. Um, so you tell them how you plan to have create a safe space. Like we can go back to, I'm going to go here, right? This is the, um, our space from the top, right? Little diagram of how our space looks. Um, you can, you know, take a screenshot of your space from the top or you, there's gonna be a floor plan of it that's gonna be available to you somehow through the landlord and say, you know, I'm gonna put a fire extinguisher up here. I'm gonna put a safety door here. This is where the speaker is where I announce that there's an emergency. That kind of stuff, you being confident and forward with what your plan is gonna be, um, is going to make the fire marshal's office be like, oh, these guys know what they're doing. They have a plan, they're good to go, stamp. Meg, do we have any other questions? I don't even know how to look for the questions. There were a few people asking about the communication systems that we use in reference to Wild Apricot. Um, so I mentioned in the chat, just for anyone who's curious, we'll post this recording to our YouTube channel and to our website, along with all the links to the resources that Catherine has covered. So there will be stuff for you to reference after this presentation as well. Cool. Um, don't burn bridges, you guys. Portland's a really small town. It turns out, weirdly, New York City's a small town. Once I worked enough jobs there, somebody doesn't like somebody, and they're like, nope, they're not getting what they want from, from me. They're not getting what they want from this office. We've got other people we can give stuff to, right? Um, Oaks Park leadership was really stressed during the pandemic. I just tried to wait for really good timing, and then it wasn't good timing, and I said, okay, well, how about if I bring sandwiches on Wednesday for lunch? You guys eat lunch, right? And they're like laughing, you know? So we ended up eating lunch, as things were back then, 12 feet from each other at a picnic table, and, you know, we finally do get a yes, but if I was showing my visible annoyance, they weren't seeing how great and easy the concept that we had to skate the vacant amusement park during COVID to make money and give them 20% of it, they weren't seeing the vision. They weren't seeing the vision. My timing was off, right? And so finally there was a day with sandwiches involved where that was a yes. And we ended up having a very, very full summer of programming, skating the amusement park. So it's, it's, it's not you. You can't take shit personally when you're dealing with um, these businesses or pretty much anyone these days seems like, but um, save the number and the info from everyone you speak with. Even if you're like, I never want to talk to Chris again. He was really mean on the phone. Save his name and number because you can also help another league mate if they end up in your position and they need to talk to that person, you can have notes from that. So again, a shared Excel sheet with who's done what and who's contacted who is great to have. Um, referring to the advice of a professional when speaking to someone else to say to, you know, to say to Sarah, I spoke with Lisa in the fire marshal's office and she was really, um, she was really encouraging 
that we would be able to use a parking lot for a public event space if we bring in, you know, some porta potties and a couple bleachers. And she was really encouraging about that. I'm noticing that you have this really cool covered parking spot, like lot space that's not currently being used on Saturday nights. Um, I'm wondering if we can work together. So reference that you've already done some due diligence to whoever you're talking to next, it just makes you, makes you have like that extra feeling of professionalism and a little huspa coming into your conversations that you are somebody who is talking to the various people that you know will eventually need to be involved in the decision-making about doing something like that. You know, in terms of our practice space, it's like, I spoke to the person who does your children's activities at the community center and they felt you know, they seemed really overwhelmed. I certainly don't want to add anything to their plate as they're coming into their summer scheduling or their, you know, or their wintertime scheduling, letting them know you already spoke to someone, right? And then moving forward to, so who, who else would I speak with, right? This is like maybe your second phone call to them. The first person you spoke with was too stressed. It doesn't mean that's a dead end. You still had a good idea. There's space in that basement at that community center for roller skating and you can get in there. Um, just because one person told you no, it doesn't mean it's a no. If you find someone helpful in a city office or a large real estate firm, get their name in their direct dial and cultivate that person, right? Like um, you don't have to be their friend on Facebook, but be their friend on LinkedIn, like some of their stuff. You know, um, uh, if you are talking to them enough, you might find out something about their lives, you know, that like they're, they're currently moving or something like that. If you have their number in your phone, you could be like, hope the move went great, Rachel, you know, just, don't be a weird stalker, but there's a way now with technology to like keep in touch with people. Um, I tend to do it a lot on Facebook until I get burnt out on it. So it's a specific way of using your Facebook page. If you don't wanna do that, you could use a league Facebook page to do that and then friend the people that have been friendly to you. Like even with how much we get done at Rose City with our schedule, there are still very specific people that I speak with when I wanna to talk to the fire marshal's office. If Michelle's not working that day, I'll be like, I'm gonna leave a message for Michelle. I'm not gonna talk to Jody, right? She's not my person. Like she's not my cultivated person who I've had coffee with, who gets what I'm putting down, you know, who understands that we're out of space that's actually not at all flammable, but we're under these parameters and we're gonna work together to find a solution. Uh, my best advice is just what I was just touching on. Um, to build an event series or gain access, access to affordable space to network, to develop a deep roster of people you can call for advice as needed. Um, so as I was just saying to like, if you hear something weird about something and someone else told you something different, call that person back and be that person that can connect the dots between it. None of this is wasted time or effort. It'll feel like it. Once you talk to 10 people and you don't have a lead or you've called five spaces and you don't have a lead, it's not wasted time. So don't, don't devalue the time that you're putting into it, right? Have a conversation with that person. Like I always try to find out at least one or two things about the person I'm on the phone with. Like John at the OLCC, he loves to go fishing for salmon. I'll be like, I heard the salmon, we're good. I don't know anything about salmon, but he's also a really nice guy as it turns out. So find somebody that you actually have a rapport with and build a rapport with those people because you're gonna need them later. Especially if, you know, in three or five years, you're the size of a league that, has a permanent space and has a hundred members. I mean, if that is like your stretch goal, then absolutely don't burn any bridges in your town. The towns are just smaller than you think they are even when they're in New York City. And then this is how our space is laid out. Um, when we get to my next talk, we're gonna cover this in Finding Your Home at 928 at high noon. Uh, about how to get butts and seats safely for events and how to work with various parties to do that, cover things like um, easy ways to do your ticketing, easy ways to um, set up your nonprofit status with your state and things like that. So um, come back to that talk if you wanna learn a little bit more about bigger picture things as you move into thinking through um, how to get to a point where you have publicly ticketed games. But if that feels really overwhelming right now, that should all be recorded and you can watch that in a year or two, or you can just give me a call when you get to that point. And then I do wanna give a shout out to the latest, um, well, for 15 years, we've been really good friends with a company called Bold Type Tickets. They've done all of our ticketing. We happen to um, have just started using them because the Portland Mercury is one of the few local papers that's like still in circulation. Most local papers have gone out of circulation. If yours hasn't, that's a good partner. That's somebody to call for sure. Like if you're, 
in a town that has a local paper. Um, those are usually really creative people that know how to get shit done and know a lot of people. So that's a great partner to cultivate. It's been great for Rose City, but we have launched an aspect of our ticketing platform that's specific for roller derby tickets. I've walked a couple different league decision makers through it in the past week or two. Rose City started posting our stuff and our goal is we hope that at some point this will be a hub, right? For what, what roller derby is going on where at any time, you know, whether it's a juniors game, a recreational game, or a, our, our division one game. Like hopefully at some point you'll be able to sort by city and you can see what roller derby is going on where and it'd be super fun for all of us to have that as a resource. But Rose City Rollers has been working with bold type tickets on this and their customer service is phenomenal. And they've never done anything weird like hold our money because event cancellations or whatever, like all the refunds that went out during COVID were all completely automatic automatic, and there were no, no questions asked. Like they, they couldn't have been cooler. So just recommending them when you get to the point when you do want to get some ticketed events in the roster. Um, questions? Or anything I didn't cover or covered too quickly? Wendy's raised their hand. If I push this, does that mean I can see it? Maybe. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, Wendy, you can talk. Awesome. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you can speak just a little bit about your nonprofit status and how you went about partnering with either other nonprofits or using your space for other money making ventures so that you did not uh, run afoul of your uh, nonprofit status. Yeah, you know, it's it seems scarier than it is. Um, I would I did not get the nonprofit status that happened well before I was here, but it's incredibly useful. And I noticed that leagues don't use it. Um, partnering with other nonprofits can get you access to grant monies very quickly, especially if they're youth focused. So right now we have a number of things going on. Um, and first of all, a great question for people is, do you really have nonprofit status or are you just operating as a nonprofit and you don't have it? Because not to say that that other organization isn't valuable to you and isn't community building and given all the good feels, but if you're going to end up asking for grant money or going in together on a space, they're going to want to see that IRS paperwork that actually says you're a nonprofit. Um, and it's easier to set up than you might think. Rocket Mean is going to give, Meg, is she going to give a talk specifically on setting up a nonprofit or is that rolled into something else? Yeah, so next week we're going to have a discussion that's specifically around sponsorships and how to approach partners in that respect. And then we're going to have our development manager, Chloe, join us for another session that has more to do with grants and donors and more of the sort of nitty gritty of nonprofits coming mm -hmm. up. But yeah, I would say, so those are great to attend and kind of touch on a little bit of what you're touching on, Wendy, but specifically right now, like Rose City, we found an after school program, Active Children Portland. Um, we knew we wanted to start our skate mobile, skating in the public, right? That's not something that was part of our mission as a roller derby before a couple of years ago, but we wanted to start bringing roller derby into the public and into underserved populations because it's so empowering for kids, obviously. And it's already all there and structured. So we worked with another nonprofit called Active, Active Children's Portland. They were doing mostly soccer after school programs, but we were a, able to immediately jump in with their program. And they were like, roller derby after school programs, we'll just put two more options on our website for the fall and you'll run roller derby at these schools. And we will pay you out of the grant money that we already got. And then in the following years, we were able to get grant money for after school programs. So I love where your head's at, like sliding in with a nonprofit that's a little more established than yourself or even somebody that's like new and budding can be a great way to like join forces and go after some, some money that might be available. There's also, um, in Portland, there's a group called NAIA, it's the Native American Youth Association, and they have a huge space that's great for roller derby. So we've recently approached them and said, hey, we're pretty sure we can grant fund this. We wanna bring roller derby programming to your space if you want us, right? If you'll have us. And we have some, some roller derby players that actually are connected with the organization. So it made sense to reach out to them. So um, is, am I answering your question, Wendy, or is there more that I'm not getting? No, I think you hit it. Um, yeah, we're just uh, run into a few issues where, you know, partnering on a space with with a with a for-profit organization 
um, might not be in our best interest and you know, trying to approach that and again, look at ways that we can use that space to help support our mission and to keep the doors open while also um, you know, being wise about our partnerships and again, not messing up our nonprofit status, which we did work very hard for a few years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think the most thing, the most about partnering with just far and wide, I mean, during COVID, we opened like a drive-in comedy thing at the hangar that I that I spearheaded because it's like we just need to make some money here and none of that was problematic for us I mean we are raising money for our mission right now our mission is affected by COVID but we were still doing as much roller derby as we could but yes all of our money was coming in through like comedy shows and drive-in movies and that was not an issue for us it's excellent yeah that's that's great to hear because I think people get into a space where they're like if it's not roller skating we might lose our nonprofit status okay. And yeah, very inflammatory and scary sounding, but right. yeah, it's great. To, it's great to get that confirmation. Thanks. No, no, you're allowed to raise money for your nonprofit by doing any wacky thing that you want to do, in my experience. Um, what other wacky things did we do? Many wacky things. <laughs> um, anybody else have any questions? I hope this was helpful. If there is, there are, if there are things that I didn't cover that you're like, yo, Catherine, you didn't cover this really obvious thing um, about how to find a space at the level that I'm at, just send me an email, events with an S, events at rosecityrollers.com or Catherine.howard. Both of those email addresses are on the website and they'll be in this presentation when it's posted. But I just thank everybody for coming and I hope that we're providing helpful information. If we are not, or you need other information, please let us know because our intention is to, um, you know, we're in a space of being pretty healthy post COVID and that's because we already had staff in place and without staff in place, I can understand how so many leaks were affected completely differently than Rose City was um, as hard as it was for us. Um, or people are just starting out fresh with a lot of like new energy and enthusiasm around it and have new players because the old players that used to make these decisions retired. I'm also hearing that story a lot and the passing down of historical knowledge um, isn't something that even Rose City is very good at with leagues, right? So like um, overall, I would say that, you know, the takeaway here is if we're not getting you what you need, you need something else, reach out to us. We really wanna help everybody to um, make roller derby built back up and beyond what it was before the pandemic. So thank you all for coming and let me know if I can help you further. Thanks everyone, have a great day. This will be up on our YouTube channel and website um, probably within the next week, but reach out if you have any questions. Have a great day, you guys, bye.